Hello and welcome to a short video regarding the occurrence and treatments of a herniated disc. Over the course of this short video we will be examining the various aspects of the injury. Uh, right, in order to understand this injury we need to examine what it is, how it occurs within the athletes and, and in sporting injuries, its symptoms and then how they're treated. Right, a slip disc is scientifically acknowledged as a prolapsed intervertebra uh, intervertebral disc and occurs along the spine due to stress and an overload uh, of intra intradiscal pressure. According to the NHS, uh, the people that are most uh, likely to be affected by this injury are 30 to 50 year old males as it transpires more frequently in males than does in females. Um, the injury transpires when there is a tear in the annulus fibrosis of the intervertebral disc. This can then cause the nucleus propulsus to bulge out and compress along the spinal nerves and, muscle, and this causes muscular pain, discomfort and even loss in the function in the lower back. The common cause of a herniated disc is lifting and this has been known to happen in athletes along such as weightlifting and you know Olympic lifting and stuff like that. And the biomechanical uh, mechanical technique of the lift is critical for successful performance and injury prevention. Um, so here is a bird's eye, uh, uh, bird's eye diagram of the of a comparison of the two spines. Uh, the first spine on the left portrays a healthy injury, uh, a healthy injury-free spine, uh, spine with uh, uh, an intact annulus fibrosis. However, if you look here, um, the spine on the right. Uh, portrays the tear of the annulus uh, fibrosis, which is here, and the nucleus propulsus point here, which is there, uh, right there, uh, which is located within the annulus fibrosis to bulge out and compress the nerve. The, the common causes of a herniated disc are lifting, trauma, and compression of the spine. In a sporting situation, such as Olympic lifting and weightlifting, the biomechan biomechanical technique of the lift is critical for successful performance and injury prevention. Uh, for example, when performing a deadlift, the correct lift technique requires the athlete to start with their back straight, knees bent and chest out. As the move progresses, the back should remain in a straight position uh, to keep the interdiscal pressure low until the body is at a standing position. Here is a picture of the transition of the deadlift. So as you can see, in the three stages of the deadlift, the back remains straight at each point. Uh, however, uh, when bad lifting techniques are employed, the athlete is at much higher risk of developing a prolapsed intervertebral disc, as shown in the video. Uh, the video shows and highlights the rounded back at the first two stages, uh, which puts the spine in an unnatural position and increases the risk of herniated disc. So, lifting techniques are a common cause of herniated discs within everyday life as well. Studies such as Mund to tell. Uh, found that frequent lifting with straight knees and a curved back was related to a greater risk of a herniated lumbar disc. Uh, also, Batiatel found to be one of the most common causes of a herniated disc within working situation in a recent case study. Welcome to Robbie Forum. <laughs> Jack. Uh, this is Jack Senechal. Um, he's a Robbie player. Um, and uh, we're here interviewing him today to find out uh, about a serious injury he had a while ago while playing rugby and how he got back in his rehabilitation uh, and his road to recovery. Um, and so actually what happened with Jack is he, he suffered a disc herniation, um, uh, his lumbar invertebrae. So he's going to tell us about that. So how did this, uh, how did this uh, injury occur? Well, it was a couple of years ago now and um, I was playing for my local rugby club uh, in my usual position of fly off. And it was only a sevens tournament so it wasn't something very serious but uh, you know how it is these days, rugby is never very friendly. And um, basically I was just uh, doing what I do in the game and I just got hit in the back after I passed the ball really late and uh, I went down, felt like I'd been steamrolled, you know, it was horrendous and uh, I was whisked off to the hospital and they told me I'd uh, done my spine pretty badly and compressed my spine and actually popped an earth, so it's quite serious at the time. Right, so the injury that I sustained was caused from, uh, you know, an absolute beast back in the day. He was, uh, he was massive, you know, like even from early on in the game, I recognised him that he was going to be a tough, uh, tough opponent, and that he was, he was there to play. He was really there to compete. I uh, just didn't expect how severe it was. Um, it all started from the second half. I got the ball from uh, a breakdown, you know, seven breakdown, and. Uh, just uh, went forward, I beat my first man and then uh, was looking to offload the ball uh, as, a, as a second opponent came at me um, and uh, I got I got one pass away and uh, my, my teammate made you know, 
good few yards, and I was just watching play and uh, probably should have been supporting him, but uh, Danny, Danny, didn't do it at the time. Come left, 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 This huge ah! sort of like just smash in the back, in my back, in my lower back, and um, I went tumbling to the floor, and it was it felt like something like literally a train just hit me. So, um, how long did it take you to recover from this injury? Uh, I still haven't recovered in truth, to be honest. Yeah, I still can't play rugby to the top extent in the game. But I think to even be actually playing the sport again took me about two years. Yeah, yeah so you said it, I mean, it, it possibly stopped you playing for a while. I mean, was there uh, is any psychological effects? Yeah, massive ones. I mean, um, I was playing Scotland under 18 internationals, so I was at the, sort of, you know, the peak of my career and I was, you know, loving it because it you know, I love rugby, but um, it was enormous impact on my psyche and my sort of my confidence levels, and then actually my motivation just to play. I just didn't want to go out there anymore because I was worried that you know it could happen again. And it, it's because I'm already weakened by it. I would I wouldn't be able to take another hit, and I'd probably end up in a wheelchair or something like that. So what about the psychological effects? So what is the thought process of an athlete post injury, and how does this relate to Jack personally? And how does it identify even quantify returning to a similar sporting level? Well, these are some of the things that an athlete might respond to. They might have an unnecessary focus on the injury. And Jack said this, that he had a, a problem letting go of that. Uh, possibly an alienation. Um, Ermelo and Torres 1990 from their teammates. And, and Jack, in his interview, was saying how he didn't really feel he could uh, mix with his teammates again at such a competitive level. A competitive an a anxiety heightened. Just what I said in Bianco 2001, where you would be heightened just by the mere thought of going back into a contact sport. Now, one of the quotes Jack said was, it had an enormous impact on my motivation just to play. And Ken and Kroll 2009, the theory of planned behaviour, basically, I did basically how important intention and motivation was to someone to get back into this kind of sport. And this was highlighted by Jack when he said, I just didn't want to go out there again. Highlighting the importance of motivation and further performance. So the avoidance coping, modifying the conditions that led to initial injury, this is what it's about. And we, we thought it's a really good prevention and a way in which Jack could, could aid this and aid his recovery. Is looking at this idea of potentially taking a alternative work in the rugby setup. So maybe working under a coach or under the management team just to make his mind get off that idea of the injury and those distractions that are there. Another way which we looked at was the stage of change model. Francesco declared in 1982, and this is an idea of how someone would go from one stage where they've had a huge injury and back up to that stage, and being caught important not to have a relapse in the way that they deal with these things. Now, so Jack, we would have this pre-contemplation, would be potentially avoidance coping, where he would get involved, and then as time would, would, would go on, he'd get more contemplation, where he would think about maybe, maybe part, you know, partaking in a few small games with the kids, and then maybe going to determination and action, and maybe leading back into the sport again. Biomechanical approach. The first study using cervical region of a, of a healthy pig's spine, the study found that repeated flexion and extension can cause disc herniations, but when the axial compression force was applied uh, was greater, the herniations became more frequent and more severe, therefore showing that when Jack was hit hard, was hit hard by the other person, the compression on his spine and the twist caused the herniation to happen. The uh, second uh, article found that prolonged sitting in a static and vibrating environment caused mechanical change in the properties of the lumbar and vertebral discs. This led to a greater instability and therefore increases the chances of herniations. So on the way to the seventh tournament where he was hit, sat in the car, that caused the instability of his spine. When recovering from a prolapsed disc, it can be treated conservatively or surgically, depending on the severity of the injury. These include pain relief methods such as anti-inflammatories given to increase mobilisation and reduce inflammation around the nerve roots. Staying active is key to the recovery process due to the potential harmful effects of prolonged bed rest. Ultrasound techniques are also applied by physiotherapists to increase blood circulation reduce pain, and also to increase range of motion. However, in more severe cases where this is not recovered after these conservative treatments, an MRI scan is given to confirm the diagnosis of the prolapsed disc. Followed by this, 
an injection of chemopapin and chemonucleosis, which is aims to reduce the size of the herniation by digesting nuclear material and reducing inflammation, which releases pressure on the nerve root. After looking at the causes of the injury, we can now determine ways to which the population may prevent a, pro, a prolapsed lumbar disc in the future. Uh, preventative uh, techniques include keeping active with resistance and cardiovascular exercise in order to keep the back muscles strong and prevent further degeneration. Uh, core exercises and flexibility. Nelson Natal found that the aggressive back strengthening exercises decreased the need for surgery in patients who have previously had their injury. Uh, applying correct lifting techniques when uh, lifting any, any, any uh, weight. Uh, and uh, the correct technique being back, keeping your back, uh, your back straight and not curving in the spine, uh, bent knees and your chest out, so in exercises. Uh, avoid prolonged sitting, which can cause generation of the vertebral discs and increase in intrinsical pressure. And if pain occurs, uh, lie flat on a solid surface for realignment of the spine.